elsewhere. Um, we are downloading all the time um, an information source, just like a computer downloads information and puts a visual representation of that on the screen, even though it's not like that at all. You know, I mean, there's not pictures and um, and graphics and words on the information that the computer is decoding. It's computer codes. It's information codes. And the computer decodes that into what we see on the screen. Well, what we're doing with this fake matrix, this fake reality that we think is real, is we're decoding information in, in the, the, basically the same way. And we are manifesting in our visual and other senses decoded by the brain and indeed the whole genetic system, um, a reality that we think is real, but isn't. And this is why you have this apparent contradiction between the mass of what we call science um, studying the world in its so-called and apparent physicality, and at the same time, you have quantum physics showing that there is no physicality. Because what mainstream science, in almost its totality, is doing is studying the illusion, thinking it's real. And what quantum physics is doing is studying the illusion, or at least one level of it. So that's the matrix part of this mix. The Star Wars part of this mix is that there is a non-human force that's behind the creation of this fake reality that is manipulating our perception of everything, including self and reality and life, so that we unknowingly are slaves and servants to that force. And what I saw in Jupiter Ascending is that very theme that I've been writing about all these years. Well, Big Brother moves on again this week, or more like Big Sister in Britain, in the form of uh, Home Secretary Theresa May, who has announced more anti-terrorism uh, measures And you'll remember in the wake of 9-11 in uh, North America, Britain and other countries, a great swathe of anti-terrorism uh, legislation uh, came in, in which the definition of what was meant by terrorism, terrorists, terrorist activity, was so ill-defined and uh, so lacking detail in the definition of what the law was targeting, that those uh, laws could be used across the, uh, the society in general. And they were, and they have been. Uh, we have had some extraordinary examples of the way in uh, Britain that anti-terrorism legislation has been used to, um, to keep surveillance on people and, and be used against people who are absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. I'll give you an example. Um, one local council used anti-terrorism legislation to keep surveillance on um, a couple to make sure that they did live in the catchment area of the school that applied for their child to attend. And this is what has been going on. And so when something comes out and someone makes a speech like Theresa May this week and says, you know, these are new laws uh, against terrorism, terrorist activity, or this, this new word now, the laws against extremism, define extremism. Uh, uh, exactly. And so the, the laws that they are bringing in, the new ones announced this week, are designed in just the same way uh, to be applied to the, the, um, the population in uh, general and very much um, to people like me and, and, and others 
who are exposing the the scams and the conspiracies involving governments and all the rest of the the networks of deceit and I'll get into that as we go along and you know when you look at um, this whole kind of subject area what's happening in Ferguson Missouri with the the, the protests uh, uh, which of course have, have gone nationwide in the United States and, and even uh, manifested in, in in London too uh, too 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 and um, so it's vital that we see how the dots connect to see how the scam is unfolding to take away more and more and more of, of our basic freedoms uh, for free expression free speech free perception and free opinion all these are being targeted by anti-terrorism legislation and um, this is a newspaper report on Theresa May's stuff this week universities will have to ban hate preachers from speaking on campus under a crackdown unveiled yesterday by Theresa May once again we're looking for definitions what defines a hate preacher some of it can be obvious they're preaching hatred against people and and, and preaching uh, violence against people and war against people yeah you can you can see that but unless it's absolutely defined you can then start to uh, widen that so governments say well this person exposing this politician or exposing this uh, scam uh, and conspiracy within government is preaching hatred against government hatred against government ministers and it could it could very easily be uh, be widened to do that and and is I mean the the examples are there um, endlessly from previous uh, uh, legislation claiming to be against terrorism schools colleges prisons and councils will also be ordered to put in place anti-extremism policies okay define extremism again well you, you can you can define it in a small area uh, although they don't uh, but then you can widen it well is someone it says uh, 9-11 was an inside job are they extremists well that's the idea to move this and use this legislation to um, bring about a situation where that is precisely the case so um, conspiracies uh, and exposing conspiracies having an opinion about conspiracies will eventually be considered extremism and thus banned this is where it's leading and this is why we need to keep our eyes right on the ball with all this because it's very clear and there are past precedents like I say that that show that this is just the foot in the door it's not where it's meant to stay it was such a profound occasion it's still um, it's still kind of with me um, the, the energy of that day and I know from people who've contacted me through various means and put things on social media said things to people I know that um, the audience of Wembley um, a, a very large number of people anyway went through some really profound transformations during the day and I can completely understand it because of what I experienced and it, it took my mind back to just just a few months coming up 25 years ago March 1990 when I walked into a psychics house in southern England a lady called Betty Shine and was told I was going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets and all the things that actually unfolded since but in terms of today's subject what I was told through her and indeed through other psychics that I met in that period when I was bumping into psychics all the time when you know, this uh, kind of change in my life first started and there was a common theme there were a number of common things but in terms of today's subject there was this one that there was an energetic 
change coming. Like a frequency change, like a vibrational change. That was going to awaken humanity from its slumber, from its coma, from its sleep. And people were going to awaken to their true nature, infinite awareness, having an experience. They were going to wake up to what was really happening in the world, as opposed to what they'd been programmed to believe was happening all their lives. And that this energetic change was going to be like an alarm clock waking people up to see what they hadn't seen before on multiple, multiple levels of being and in multiple ways and I dubbed this energy the truth vibrations all those years ago it's why my first book after I went through my own kind of mind-blowing awakening uh, was called the truth vibrations and I, I use that term because one of the other effects that I was told about then that this energetic change would bring about the truth vibration change was that all that had been hidden would be brought to the surface and that was not just like I've just described people awakening to reality and self and the world but actually massive secrets that have been kept from us would be brought to the surface. It was almost like um, the energetic change would, were going to bring this hidden stuff to the surface. And there's nothing that those who wish to keep the secrets secret could do about it. Because this energetic change is beyond anything that they can deal with. And... Of course, at that time, 1990, there was no evidence for that whatsoever. There was no evidence of any awakening. There was no evidence of any of what I've just said. But as I've gone on through the years, it's become more and more evident that this energetic transformation is real. It was said that um, the most open would be affected by this change first. And then eventually, um, even those that at that time were solid, closed to anything beyond the, the norm and the program perceptions of the system, they were going to be start going to start being affected as well in, in, in terms of looking anew at self in the world and that all came back to me um, massively at Wembley last Saturday because the energy in that room and the impact that it had upon people including myself was just beyond words it was extraordinary I had a spare hour a few days ago and I thought I'll go on that Twitter and have a go and see see what you do. So I um, I went through that morning's headlines on uh, davidike.com or some of them anyway. Made a few uh, uh, comments and you know on what was happening in the news and what have you. Um, and then I shut everything down and I got on with my day, got on with my life. Well, um, as the comedian Peter Kay said in one of his jokes you'd have thought I'd have gone in their house on Christmas Day and pissed on their kids. Too many tweets. You've over-tweeted. Beg your pardon? Too many tweets. You mean there are rules on Twitter? I mean, if you think there's too many tweets from someone, well, don't bloody read them then. Go to the next one. There were loads of others being posted at the same time as, as I was doing my thing. Oh, no. Too many tweets. And apparently what you're supposed to do is, um, is space them out through the day. Well, I don't want to be on Twitter endless times a day. I had a spare hour. This is what I've got to say. Okay, see you guys. All the best. 
But no, there are rules. There's got to be rules for everything. You can't have life without rules. Well, actually, you can have life without rules. What you can't have without rules is control. And we are drowning in bloody rules. Anyway, some of the responses were, were like extraordinary. I mean, you know, the, the things that humans get their knickers in a bloody twist about. You know, there's all these things going on in the world, all these, all these things that need addressing, all these things that need focusing upon, that need, that need challenging. And yet we get diverted and, and, and upset and, or even, you know, kind of furious about things that don't freaking matter. This is, this is one response um, that kind of makes my point. Um, this says, um, enough is enough. Okay, fair enough. After 20 years, you have lost a fan. 70 tweets already today is far too many tweets. Well, it wasn't 70. Don't be silly. Um, but let's think about that. After 20 years, you've now lost a fan. So, okay, for 20 years then, um, the person thought I was doing a decent job. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and if they've been um, looking at what I'm doing for 20 years, it means that they must realize that there's some kind of um, conspiracy going on to enslave humanity on a scale and to an extent that was significantly understated by George Orwell. Right? Yeah. So you think that I've done a decent job for 20 years and you realize that there is a conspiracy going on that has to be addressed urgently. But you're not supporting me anymore. Let's have it again because of what? Too many tweets. I mean that, for me, is a form of madness. Um, if you look at the, uh, the definition of madness as um, the inability for balanced thought, the inability to put things, this is the word, into a perspective, then that's a, that's a form of uh, madness. And it's the big penny, the big penny that needs to drop to understand the world is that the world is mad um, and I don't just do, say that as a throwaway um, a throwaway term, a throwaway word you know people um, often think of insanity and states of insanity as people in institutions and asylums um, but the big penny is when you realise that human society is an asylum. It's a madhouse. Um, and humanity provides the inmates. We're living in a lunatic asylum called planet Earth. And humanity. And if you've got any kind of balanced mind that's when you stand out because the people in the asylum think you're crazy because to them madness is normal it's their sanity and so if you try to work out the world if you try to understand the world, if you try to make sense of the world by treating it as some kind of sane place, trying to make sense of craziness while still believing the world is in some way sane, then you're never going to get it. You'll be, you'll be on your deathbed, still trying to work it out, still trying to make sense of the world. And lots of people think, well, it must be me then. It ain't you. No. The world is mad. 
It's not you. You're the same one. And you start to realise or you start to see with crystal clarity what is happening in the world and why when you realise that you're, you're in a lunatic asylum and um, therefore insanity is the norm. And the confirmation is that if what you say has validity, then eventually it will be shown to be so. And the trick is to say what you believe to be true, what you know to be true, and not keep it to yourself and stay silent. Because what will people think of me? What will they say about me? And if you're in any way in the public eye, what will them journalists say? Well, my response to that was, don't give a shit. And it still is. Because if we're going to understand what's happening in the world, if we're going to sort out the mess, then we have to know the truth about what we're dealing with. And we're not going to do that by even if we uncover it, staying quiet because we fear consequences for ourselves. That's how the control system um, fears and terrifies people into silent acquiescence so it can go on unchallenged. So this week, uh, two things have happened in relation to my work. One, um, a book I wrote um, and came out originally in 1998 called The Biggest Secret named a Prime Minister of Britain called Ted Heath as not just a paedophile but as a Satanist and a serial child killer. Of course it was dismissed and um, Heath was around at the time. He had the passage read to him almost immediately after it was published and uh, he did nothing about it. And of course, it was the Ike's mad. Um, this week, it's been announced that um, a series of police forces in Britain uh, are investigating uh, claims that Ted Heath abused children. Well, he did on an industrial scale, but he killed most of them on an industrial scale. And today I'm going to talk about some of the background that I've been uh, told over the years about Heath. Um, some of which will lead many people, even now, to say, Jack mad. Have you heard what he said about Ted Heath? Um, and then this book, The Perception Deception, massive work, um, and many books before this, going back many years, have said that we live in a fake reality. We live in the very advanced equivalent of a computer simulation. And there is a force controlling that simulation which is seeking to control us. And again, have you seen what that Ike's saying? That we live in, oh God. And um, this week, um, the story in the mainstream media, is our universe fake? Physicists claim we could all be the playthings of an advanced civilization. Physicists say there's a possibility that our world is merely a simulation. They claim there may be evidence of this if only we know where to look. For instance, some of the laws of physics may not quite add up, they say. Well, actually the laws of physics do add up, as perceived by uh, scientists. But they only add up if we live in a simulation, which we do. Um, and all this comes together in um, basically this. Wisdom is knowing 
how little we know. And what I call the arrogance of ignorance is the biggest block to human understanding about anything. The arrogance of ignorance um, is a human disease. Uh, most journalists suffer from it, uh, many to a very serious extent, fatal to their perception. And what it means is you take the norm, whatever it is at any point, as the truth from which you judge everything. Therefore, anything that is outside the official truth must be wrong, mad or dangerous. And so dismiss it. And when you look through history, the only people that have moved the human race on in terms of expansion of understanding have been those that have challenged the norms. Because if that is not true, it means the norm must know everything at any point, which clearly it bloody doesn't. But the arrogance of ignorance says, like in the journalistic case, I mean, it's swamped with it. Um, I'm going to abuse and ridicule this person because he's saying something different to the norm that I've been told is normal. And when you look through history, um, and you look at uh, philosophers, and people who speak any kind of wisdom, there is a common theme. They use slightly different words, but the theme is the same. Here's um, three examples. Socrates in ancient Greece. To know is to know that you know nothing. That is the meaning of true knowledge. Confucius in China. Real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. And uh, another one, he who knows all the answers has not been asked all the questions. Another great Confucius quote. And then uh, finally, Albert Einstein. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. And uh, that does for most journalism, for a start, and most people, in my experience. And it's not just uh, the height of ignorance. That's one level of it. But then to abuse those saying something else, that is the arrogance of ignorance. The word occult just means hidden. It's hidden knowledge. But in the sense that it's used most times in you know everyday life it's used in the context of the negative use of hidden knowledge in fact when you come to the church and organizations like that they seem to think that all hidden knowledge is is bad is evil it's not knowledge is just knowledge it's like a microphone a microphone is not uh, positive, negative, good or bad, it's how you use it. Same with the printing press, same with hidden knowledge, which has become known as the occult. But the, the fact does remain that it is clear to people like me who've researched this ongoing for a long time, that we are seeing the normalisation of the negative use of occult knowledge. Uh, we're seeing it with the way that Halloween has become more and more like a, a mini Christmas, where uh, kids go out with their trick and treat and it's all uh, fun and all, all that. But the, the, the Halloween um, trick or treat type experience is is Satanism light. I mean, that people might find that extreme, but it's not, because at the same time as those uh, kids are trick-and-treating and, and, and going around dressed as, as, as witches or ghosts or whatever, in the hidden world, staggering numbers of children and others are being sacrificed by Satanists and crazies, insane people, all over the world in that period we call Halloween. And 
it's very much like uh, the Eucharist, uh, where in the church where they they drink um, the blood of Jesus as wine and they eat his flesh as a biscuit or something. It's Satanism light. It's mirroring the real rituals of really drinking blood and really eating flesh that go on in these full-blown um, satanic networks, which infiltrate, of course, the politics, indeed direct politics and the corporate world and banking and, 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 and all the rest. And then you've got things like the, the, the Harry Potter uh, stories um, and the uh, blatant now uh, satanic occult imagery and symbolism and, 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 and rituals that you see masquerading as the entertainment industry, be it stage shows or, or movies uh, or whatever. And so I found it um, interesting this week, to say the least, to find that the, uh, the Ouija board is making a comeback. And this is all part of this normalization of the occult. While we um, do more research on all that, uh, people around the world who these days um, ask questions about these events and don't just take it like a sponge from the mainstream media, um, I'm going to concentrate this week on the other major story, the one that since the, uh, the outrage in Paris has been taken off the front pages, which is where it spent many, many days. And that, of course, is this, the, um, the story of Prince Andrew uh, and the allegations made that he um, had, shall we say, relations with an underage um, sex slave, a sex slave of a man called Jeffrey uh, Epstein. Now, um, Epstein is a, a, a multi-billionaire who um, was prosecuted for procuring um, uh, sex with a, a minor. And it was part of a uh, much bigger investigation into Epstein's um, activities. And that is kind of laid out in considerable detail in uh, court documents that have been filed in the United States based on the fact that the alleged victims of this man um, were not allowed to have a say or an opinion or an input into the most extraordinary um, plea bargain in which um, Epstein, who was facing investigations um, into um, activities and behaviour that could do you 20 years or more in jail, um, I think it was something like 13 months that he served as a result of a plea bargain, which allowed him to plead guilty to one um, certainly lesser charge compared with the other potential charges that he was facing. So this outrage by... Um, alleged victims has brought this um, court situation uh, to the fore as they try to get some uh, justice as they see it um, for the fact that basically they see Epstein got away with it and of course when you are a billionaire with um, high powered and well connected legal teams then you've got a better chance of getting a deal like that than you have if you're a member of the public. And, you know, obviously um, it's an ongoing court situation, which Prince Andrew has been brought into as um, being named in, 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 in some of the um, allegations that are made in these court documents. Um, but... While the courts and the legal system um, are pouring over this and it's going through its process, um, many of the themes that come out of this actually are classic themes um, relating to research that I've been doing for well in excess of 20 years. Uh, in the, the late 90s, something like nearly 20 years ago, so 17, 20 years ago, get the sun out of that, I, uh, I published this book, The Biggest Secret, 
uh, which at the time many people thought, as usual, um, that I was crazy to um, suggest and name um, many famous people, both sides of the Atlantic, in relation to um, paedophilia, Satanism, and horrific um, violent abuse, in some cases, of children and young people. Ike's mad, that's too far-fetched. Well, what you realise when you research these subjects in any depth and for any length of time is that the definition of far-fetched takes a way big expansion once you realise what the rich and famous are doing behind the facade that we see in the mainstream media and the mainstream uh, world. And one of the themes that comes out of this is networks of child traffickers and networks of this and and the um, uh, the documents uh, talk about how um, people like one of the um, the girls now a, a woman who is uh, making these claims Virginia Roberts how they were flown around the world to Britain and other uh, places as part of this this network that they talk about and it's it's very difficult for people, I understand, to conceive how organised all this is um, in terms of the paedophile networks and the, um, the satanic networks and so on, which interpenetrate politics and banking and, 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 and all of these things that direct the world that we live in and the society that we live in. Um, but if you imagine, imagine the world... Uh, the planet and then you lay over the the planet a a web a, a network of strands in a web um, and at that point you're looking at the world and you're looking at strands and um, connections all over it it's obvious but now <clears throat> put countries on top of that web put corporations on top of that web put cultures, put belief systems, put um, uh, all these um, different expressions of human society on top of that web, put the banking system on top of that web with all the apparently different banks um, uh, competing with each other and that, like I say put the countries on top of that uh, web and, and all the things that you see in society and now you look at that and you would see a series of individual situations. You'd see individual countries, you'd see individual banks, um, individual media operations, in, in, in individual corporations of biotech and pharmaceutical and, and, and all the rest of them. But even though everything now looks like diverse and there's all these different unconnected things you're looking at so how can there be any connection and any coordination I mean look at it it's all it's different there's lots of different things underneath all that is that web is that network and you start to realize when you do the research and it takes a long time and it takes a lot of dedication um, to, to, to pour through this stuff year after year um, what you find is this bank and that bank and that corporation, that government, they're all expressions of the same web. Child trafficking, prostitution and all the horrors that go with that. And it's everywhere, child abuse. And the Member of Parliament has been... Uh, the most vocal in demanding uh, action and uh, exposure of those involved, particularly in the political arena, uh, said this week that the scale of child abuse is basically staggering and um, what the heck is going on? Well, I've been on the case for um, a long time, as readers of my books will know. 
And the time is coming when to answer these sorts of questions and to answer other mysteries about the way the world is run and what happens, we really do need to move beyond the concrete-minded, programmed, since birth view of the world, reality and everything. Because questions like, why is it becoming clear? I've been writing it for a long time, but it's becoming clear in the public arena now. Why is it that worldwide the scale of child abuse is almost unimaginable? Well, that question can be answered, but not by staying within the straitjacket, tiny straitjacket at that, of conventional views of the world. And, you know, we're born into this program and the program is downloaded to us through parents who've already downloaded the program, through the education system, through the media, through academia and what passes for science, through politics. It's all downloading the program, which is a particular worldview within incredibly narrow lines of limitation. And if you try to explain the world in all its forms and expressions, from that perspective, you're never going to do it. You're going to find cul-de-sacs all over the place that, that you can't go any further because um, if, if this worldview of reality, etc., is true, then, then what seems to be happening can't be possible. So it can't be explained by that. And science is not something like official history is not something to reveal. It's actually a structure to suppress and to stop people going into um, areas of legitimate research because of ridicule or dismissal. Sometimes in terms of scientists, literal dismissal. If you don't sing from the song sheet. So questions like why the scale, uh, the scale of child abuse? And so many other questions. Why do they do this? Why do they do it like that? Why is that happening? Can be explained. I'm explaining it all in great detail at the Wembley event in October. But it can be explained, but only, only if minds are prepared to open and perceive possibility beyond the confines of their lifelong programmed indoctrinated sense of everything and it's not even that you need to sit in a darkened room and tune in although that ain't a bad thing you need to be dark because evidence that the accepted view of everything is simply not true is, is there in, in hard facts if that's what people perceive everything through. Because if you look at uh, the findings of quantum physics, you see clearly that this solid world is not solid. Um, actually, um, what it is, is an information field or information fields, and we are decoding those fields into a reality, just like this computer here decodes the internet from information into what we see on the screen as graphics and pictures and videos and all that. So, 
if we get down to basics in terms of the world view, you say to most people, is the world solid? Well, yeah, mate, of course it is. Look, but it can't be. So there's suddenly not only a vast new point from which to observe everything and perceive everything, there's also the end of limitation. Because if you perceive the world to be physical, solid, in the way that we perceive it and experience it, then so much is not possible. And so when people like me come along and say, this is how it's done, and that's how it's done, and that's, that's what that is, and that's how that works, they say, you're mad. You can't do that. You can't do that with a solid world. No. No, you can't. You can't. But the world ain't solid. It's an information field or fields that we are decoding into a sense of reality. And our perception of reality massively influences, in fact, dictates the reality that we decode and thus experience as what we call our lives. Because this is a, a, a global uh, agenda of mass and individual mind control, so you find it going on everywhere. But of course there are certain centres where um, you find it most concentrated in the United States and uh, Britain and uh, anything to do with Mossad uh, in Israel are some of the major, major centres, in fact the major centres that you'll find in terms of the manipulation of the individual and collective perception. And that's what it is really. Uh, my latest book is called The Perception Deception because when you look at how you control individuals and most certainly the population in general, you have to manipulate their perception of reality, their perception of self, their perception of world, world events and um, their perception of uh, endless situations because from that perception comes their response and comes their behavior. So if you can manipulate their perception to see things in a certain way, then you can manipulate them to support what you want to do as a result of that, or to oppose something you want opposed, or to turn against someone or some group as a result of the manipulation of perception. It is the whole foundation of the global conspiracy and the manipulation of uh, the human race it's controlling, manipulating and implanting their sense of reality, their perception. Now, this can be done on a mass scale and I will talk about that um, in, in other places. and it's, it, it's all in my books. But um, we've had another multiple killing this week in um, California, in the Santa Barbara area, involving uh, a young man called Elliot Roger. And I'm not saying here in a, a reflex action response that oh he was mind controlled to do that because of um, how you can manipulate public perception of things as a result of it because there's a lot more research to do although there are parts of that story that certainly don't feel right to me but there's more research to do what I want to talk about today and the information I want to uh, share with you today um, is about the potential of mind control, the systematic structure of mind control, some of the history of mind control, so that when things like this happen, and I'll be talking about some of the other um, mass killings uh, as well as we go along, when something like this happens, if you don't have the background of the possibilities of mind control to get people to, to carry out killings and, and other acts uh, basically uh, on your say-so by in effect turning the, the, the assassin or the killer or whatever into 
little more than a software program. If you don't know that potential, then when an official story comes out saying this has happened, this is who did it, and this is why, there's really no, no alternative to the official story. Uh, so the media and the authorities say, this is the story, this is what's happened, this is why. And people um, without the uh, background knowledge of the potential for mind control will say, well, well that, that's what must have happened then. But in fact, there are many other uh, possibilities. And my goodness, in the case of so many of these now infamous mass killings in the United States, there are massive probabilities that mind control was involved. I would say blatantly so in many cases. It must be a nightmare to, to work in now. I mean, if you're a genuine officer with genuine intent and not a psychopath, then it must be a, a daily nightmare for many people to work in the system as it's become. Because um, the system is the point, really. The idea they want us to believe is that the police are there to serve the public. They're not. They're not. Uh, individuals within the police might try to do that, the genuine ones I'm talking about. But that's not why the police are there. It's not why law enforcement in all its forms is there. It's not why the military is there. They're there to enforce the will of that which directs and controls the system. And um, on one side, they are about enforcing that will through laws, which that which controls the system has decided what those laws are going to be. And on the other side, to suppress and cover up any revelations that will expose those that and that which controls the system. And this week we've seen so many examples of both. Um, I've got a, a newspaper article here. And, and I mean, you know, my head just shakes all the time over this. Uh, for people around the world, um, we've had this massive political paedophile scandal going on. Investigations galore, it says here, by police and there's a, a, a political inquiries and all that stuff, which you know, is taking so long to get going, not by coincidence. And it kind of concerns the, the Thatcher administration in the 1980s, although it's still going on today. That's what they don't want us to, to, uh, to realise. But the story I'm talking about um, this week is this one. It's about a bloke called Willie Whitelaw. Willie Whitelaw um, was um, Home Secretary in the Thatcher administration and Deputy Prime Minister. And a number of sources, shall we say, over the years have told me that um, Willie Whitelaw was a paedophile. And so it makes absolute sense, this story, um, that he is said to have covered up um, the exposure of uh, paedophile activity and told the police they weren't going to investigate it. Um, it says here, detectives are investigating claims that former Conservative Home Secretary William Whitelaw ordered police to drop an investigation into a VIP paedophile ring. This is the, the latest one, you see. Here's Willie Whitelaw, Home Secretary, um, being uh, uh, accused here uh, with, with evidence that he covered up this, this paedophile ring to stop it coming out, which involved, you know, famous people, rich and famous people. Um, and, and when he finished being Home Secretary in the 80s, he was replaced by a guy called Leon Britton, as Home Secretary. And Leon Britton is now uh, part of an investigation into why uh, he or how he was given a dossier of names of uh, VIP paedophiles by uh, an MP called Jeffrey Dickens. And then that dossier went missing. Um, I mean, do coincidences happen like that? Maybe they do. But here's... Um, Here's what um, the story says. Um, 
Whitelaw allegedly told a senior Metropolitan Police boss to quash a year-long investigation into a gang accused of abusing 40 children, the youngest of whom was six. The alleged intervention came in 1980 uh, after a newspaper revealed that the country's chief prosecutor was considering 350 offences against um, the gang, including allegations that it obtained young boys for politicians, prominent lawyers and uh, film stars. Goes on, the report was published um, in a, a newspaper called The Evening News, a London uh, newspaper, uh, uh, which revealed that the police had passed evidence to the Director of Public Prosecutions, which decides if a prosecution is going to go ahead, and that up to 12 men could face trial for procuring boys uh, and sexual assault. Um, procuring children for the rich and famous, particularly you know, the, the, the political uh, classes in uh, London, is a major, major industry and, and can, can generate tremendous amounts of, uh, of money. Ask Jimmy Savile, that's what he was doing, uh, among much else. Um, so anyway, Jeff Edwards, the journalist who wrote the story, claims that just days after it was published, he was summoned by police to an interview and threatened with prosecution under the Official Secrets Act. It's supposed to protect the security, they claim. It's supposed to protect the security of the country. It's protecting the security of the system. The security of VIP paedophiles. It was the same authority that gave us the most outrageous um, fairy story in relation to the events of 9-11. And when so many lies and manipulations and fakery has been exposed in all these events before, it would be naivety in the extreme to then expect that when something comes along like Paris that the authorities are telling you the truth about it. Now, it's uh, too early to start going into uh, great detail about this happened and this is why it was and all, all that. But you can pick out the themes of um, events within what happened in Paris and connect it to other events that have actually been revealed with the passage of uh, hindsight, uh, time and research to have been a pack of lies. Um, I mean, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, is, is a classic. So it's ex extremely encouraging to see on social media and, and, and in other uh, ways, people in, in much larger numbers are saying, hold on a minute, we're not just accepting this by reflex action. Um, and, and that um, is what is necessary if we're actually going to stop being scammed by these um, terrorist events into giving more and more of our freedoms away or accepting those freedoms being taken away. Now, people um, who criticise those who question, my goodness me, has anyone got a mirror? I should have a look if that's what you're doing. Um, they might criticise the conclusions they come to, but, but asking questions, that's what we should be doing. And those that, that um, kind of um, criticise people for uh, asking questions and not accepting the official version of events, um, they, they come out with kind of all-encompassing one-liners like, oh, they say it's all a hoax. Well, some of these things are hoaxes and some of them are not. There are many different um, ways to set up something, to set up a problem, which you can then um, offer the solution to and, and change society in the way that you wouldn't have been able to without creating the problem in the first place to justify the, the change in law and, and, and um, uh, the way that society is run and controlled. So problem, reaction, solution the technique that's also been given the, uh, the, the, the name a false flag when you create a, a problem uh, covertly and then offer the solutions to the problems you've created. Um, th they're not all um, hoaxes. Um, there are many different ways that this 
scenario is played out. And to, to, to see more and more people grasping, at least to the point of considering the concept, the possibility that those um, in the shadows are through those in the public eye, creating um, problems on purpose with, the, with absolutely the goal of changing society as a result of the problem. To, 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 to grasp that and start to grasp that, another thing we need to, um, to consider and start to understand is the scale of absolute bloody evil that is behind all this. You know, because one of the things is that people uh, judge um, what others would do by what they would do. And so they say things like, they, they'd kill all those people on 9-11 just to change society. They'd never do that. No, you wouldn't do that. They do it all the time. And it's, it's this grasping of, A, the scale of evil behind the manipulation of the direction of the world. And this concept of problem, reaction, solution, which that evil uses by doing its evil and then offering a solution to its evil, which leads to more um, evil. So seeing that more and more grasped, like I say, is, is, is really encouraging in terms of where we were um, not that long ago. And when I started out on this journey 25 years ago, where we, we basically weren't at all. But like I say, um, it's not that all these things are hoaxes. There are many different ways that they play problem, reaction, solution. But certainly there are hoaxes. And I mean complete hoaxes. I mean Sandy Hook, um, the, the, the shootings at the Sandy Hook school was absolutely a hoax. And uh, if you um, have not come across this, uh, well, just go to, go to my website and put the keyword Sandy Hook in. And you'll get the archive um, articles, um, including um, the work of a man called Wolfgang Halbig. And he um, is a, a man who's had a long career in security um, and safety, including um, a career looking after the safety and security of schools in the United States. And he started out. Um, accepting the official story when when um, it was all breaking in the news to the point where he actually donated to the fund. But being a professional, being someone who was um, well aware of how all this works and, 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 and what's credible and what's not, and what should happen in reacting to these things because it's his job, he started to realise that not only were... Um, the public being told a pack of lies about um, the shootings and killings at Sandy Hook, but actually there had been no killings. And that is, if you're hearing this for the first time, absolutely shocking. You're mad, mate. What are you talking about? They'd never do that. They did do that. Look into it and look into, into Wolfgang's work and what he said and how he's been treated and threatened since he started going public on the fact that this is a nonsense. First of all, you want to change the world or create a situation. And you know that if you just denounce openly, this is what you're going to do, or this is what you want to happen, then you, you're going to get a big reaction against it. So you don't announce it openly. You play the technique of problem, reaction, solution. Stage one. You create a problem covertly. You blame it on someone else, your target, or you create a situation of um, upheaval of some kind. Uh, you then, through an unquestioning uh, media, mainstream media, you tell the public the version of the problem that you want them to believe. And what you're looking for at stage two is the reaction from the public of fear, of outrage, and basically of either a do something or you get the public into a state where they will accept what you're suggesting in ways that they never would without the initial covertly created problem. So you've created the problem, you've got the reaction, do something, or an acceptance of 
a suggestion that you, you, you of something you want to do as a result of it and then stage three you offer the solution to the problems you have covertly created now this has been used to devastating effect um, so many times over the years because if it works why change it we had a war on terror still have with our freedoms being taken away um, and war and conflicts galore and we had the invasion of Afghanistan on the basis of the official story of 9-11 being true that uh, hijackers, uh, Muslim hijackers, um, hijacked the planes and uh, flew them into the buildings etc as a terrorist act against America. So you had the problem, you had the reaction, understandable ha outrage and horror and then you had the solution and the solution has been the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, the war on terror, taking uh, freedoms away justified by fighting terrorism and the whole uh, momentum of war including Iraq and Syria and um, Libya and so on has actually been driven by that initial burst of horror from and excuse from 9-11 so if the official story wasn't true and my goodness me it wasn't um, then all that has been justified since has been on the basis of a lie a massive monumental lie and those with a mind of their own who have looked at the detailed research into the official story of 9-11 uh, have seen because it's hardly takes a genius to do so that hardly one strand of that story fits to another if this is true that can't be true if that's uh, true then that can't be true the contradictions and the anomalies are stunning and so this problem reaction solution technique has been used over and over again and what has happened to Malaysian flight uh, MH17 that came down over Ukraine has all the hallmarks of a problem reaction solution who benefits who benefits from what has happened and who benefits from me and the public believing the official version of what has happened so if you look at 9-11 who benefit, benefited from that well the Muslim world didn't clearly look at it the American people didn't of course one group and one group alone benefited primarily from 9-11 and that was anyone that wanted to launch a war on terror i.e. a war of acquisition and slaughter and anyone that wish to um, use that as the excuse to demolish civil rights rights to privacy and basic human freedoms all around the world so you look at MH17 who benefits from us believing the official story that it was taken down on purpose by uh, pro-Russian separatists who are fighting the Ukrainian actually fascist regime in Kiev who benefits from that and who benefits from the connection and the blame being handed uh, on from the pro-Russian separatists to the Russian government and Putin well anyone that wants to demonize Russia and as I've been saying in my books and in these video casts um, in recent weeks that is precisely the idea because there is a long-term plan to have a war between the West and Russia stroke China the third world war and in that you cannot divorce um, what is happening in Ukraine and the downing of um, MH17 and what is happening horrifically uh, in Gaza uh, as we speak it is possible to manipulate the brain of individuals and collectively 
um, to decode reality in the way you want. Because as um, Susan Greenfield talks about in this book, um, there was a time uh, when it was believed that the brain didn't change, that what you uh, had once the brain had developed is how it was always going to be. Now it's known that is anything but the case because of um, something they called uh, or call brain placidity which comes from a Greek word meaning to be molded and that is what is happening all the time with our daily experience is the brain is being molded to create uh, networks of chemical electrical communication uh, and, and that's changing with our experience um, and what this uh, book by Susan, Susan Greenfield is really focused upon is how the internet, social media, video games and such like is changing the brains of humanity, especially the young and why that is um, I'll come to as we go along. So all the time as we are having experiences, to put it in computer terms, the brain is downloading data and from that data it is uh, changing um, the way that it communicates and how it communicates and what it communicates uh, with. Um, this is a part of the book, where's page 55? Uh, here we go. Um, and it's saying that the internal processing of the brain will determine how you see the world. But whatever external inputs are being fed into your brain uh, at any one time, the experience of that very moment will simultaneously change that organization of brain cells and hence your thinking. One leading expert in brain development, uh, Brian Kolb, sums up, anything that changes your brain changes who you will be. No one can be in any doubt, surely, that um, the uh, internet and uh, social media and uh, video games are, are changing um, the, the, the brain um, because of the different information, the different way of working that that's brought into human society. Um, he, he goes on, your brain is not just produced by your genes, it is sculpted by a lifetime of experiences. Experience alters brain activity, which changes gene expression. Any behavioural uh, changes you see reflect alterations in the brain. The opposite is also true. Behaviour can uh, change uh, the brain. And so, um, one of the um, lines that uh, Susan Greenfield uses a lot is, use it or lose it. Because the way the brain works, if you stop using uh, part of it or, 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 or the, the networks that at that point have come together, the communication networks, then they, they fade and they disappear. So um, you can learn something and, 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 and carry out that practice, whatever you've learned. Uh, and then you stop and that connection, that network that came together because of what you learned and what you were doing, then starts to um, unravel. And there's another thing about the brain which uh, it talks about in the book, and that is that um, it doesn't do vacant space. If it's there, it will be used in some way. And there's a fascinating uh, point she makes that when people um, in older uh, days, older life, get um, cataracts, well, when the cataracts removed, um, most of the time, it seems, um, the sight returns. But with children, uh, when they get cataracts, in other words, the, the part of the brain relating to sight is, um, is not being used because of, of the, the, the effect of the cataract, then often children who then have cataracts removed 
um, have impaired vision for the rest of their life. And the way she explains it is um, the brain still changes as we get older, but it changes slower. Um, uh, older people's brains um, are, are much uh, less apt to responding and changing. And, and we use phrases like, they're set in their ways. But the brain does still change, but slowly. Whereas in children and young people, it's very relevant for the, um, the social media stuff that we're talking about and the book talks about, it changes fast. And so what's happening with the cataract example is 